Sorry, you cannot record that. <laughs> the automation is, is about achieving the goal of success. So it, it, it's, an, it's a road that we cannot, we cannot go back on that road. It will be more automation all the way. But where we are today, I think it's important and how these are treated together. The first one I, I wanted to touch upon uh, is, is, is this initial 4D. And, and I think many of you, for many years, there's been a discussion on how separate the, the aircraft lives its own life here. It plans, it calculates, it, it, it works, it develops. You saw the cockpit that you said earlier before lunch. <coughs> and, and this enormous capacity of, 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 of the aircraft here, which is to a certain extent dormant and not used in, in, in my field and the air traffic part here, which is also developing to a certain extent. But they also have very different use. This is a one single flight and that has the whole sort of spectrum of any kind of flights, being military, being civil, uh, commercial, being a general, being a hot air balloon, whatever it is, it needs to be integrated in, in, in that, that part here. Now we work with these in parallel for, 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 for a long time, but still they are parallel streams of, of, of activities. And then of course through the research, the, the, the steps now is to how can we start to integrate the knowledge between the, the airplane to the ground and, and vice versa. We use we use this today, we talk with each other and we have flight plans and so on. But how can we from a, on, on the data, not the data, data but on to the sort of on, on the uh, tactical basis exchange information in between these two here. And, and of course, from a theoretical perspective, this is not that difficult to understand. But the, the difference between, I think, research before and then CSR and initial 40, this is not, this is not just a, a test. This is based on, on real aircraft, real product, uh, product, it's real sort of industry involvement, all stakeholders are there. So once, I believe, once we are through, this will be, you can say, now we go. It's not another round of industrialization. It will be ready if we found it useful to put into operation. That has to be the, the, the idea. Now this maybe seems clear, and that's, that's just the obvious thing, but I think the history of research and development is not that it's the opposite, that it's always another barrier to cross. So I hope that this issue that you have in Alliance will not be the barrier to stop I4D to come. So uh, a little bit on what it is uh, from, a, from a practical perspective. It's to share uh, and synchronize the airborne and ground trajectory. Now you know the trajectory, the, the flight that we intend to fly. 
there's a trajectory, there's always been a trajectory on, on the airplane, which the flight management wants to fly. There's also a trajectory on the ground, calculated with the, the information given from various sources on the ground. But now we start to share them between each other here and try to synchronize them. And, and the, also the, the idea is that in the end here we need to land, and you know the, the constraints of, of, the, of the airport with a lot of traffic. If there's no traffic, there's no problem, just land. But if there's a lot, you need to see how can I steer the traffic towards a time fix. Let's say, well, you've got to be there at a certain time in order to make the flow into a certain air, airplane or airport happen. And, and, and this is the, the issues where today you just fly and let the air traffic manage this via procedure or via radar vectors or anything like that. But this is a way to plan ahead, to in the early stage set so that the optimum <coughs> flight of the aircraft can take place. This being a green issue or being a, a capacity issue and so on. We, we don't know exactly what are the breaking points of this at this stage. But basically the aircraft sends its predicted trajectory, it's being massaged here, it gets a route and it updates the predicted trajectory and it then the aircraft tell, well, based on what you told me, <coughs> I'd be able to be south of Florence or north of Florence in between this, in this rough uh, or mean and max time. <coughs> so I know, so do you know, that's where I can meet with my aircraft type, my weight and, and my, my way of flying for my airline and so on. And then it, the, uh, this is calculated and you get the required time of arrival and then a new predicted trajectory down here and you start to fly towards this. This is, this is something which is sort of the first step towards automating this interchange. It's not maybe the end state of, of this. There will be a full 4D work uh, as well, but, but it's the first step trying to look and integrate the air and the ground. And the whole way we work with this trajectory and we share it between the air and the ground. I think it's a knowledge thing to a certain extent that we learn to accept the differences between the air and the ground. Okay. To a certain extent, now from a liability perspective or, or so on, on the, on, the, on the cockpit side, and on the ground controller side, we only have uh, female controllers in Sweden. Uh, they are better, more efficient. Still away. The, to a certain extent, the, the I4D means that, that you have a closed loop between the aircraft and the ground. And that loop is, of course, dependent if it's on the communication or if the aircraft or the surveillance system or the ground, ground network and the automation system, oh sorry, ATM system, it's a closed loop to a certain extent taking place on that. And that means that if you take something out here and something happens, who's in charge of that? Maybe not only for the sake of an event of a disaster, but also from a business perspective, if I have lack of service, who's gonna take care of that situation? Uh, then on the ground, the, the, the ATC needs to make sure that we have those fantastic I4D equipped aircraft. We will have very good aircraft capabilities with sat navs and so on that we have today. And we will have non-4D aircraft, I'm, I'm sorry, Kaylin, but aircraft which are not that competent for, for historical reasons. Unfortunately, they all want to land in Firenze. So that, that this needs to be integrated here as well. And, and I think that's the challenge of, of, of moving to the initial 4D and, and try to make the automation on the ground handle all these kind of things. But this is the interesting part from CISAR that you build a loop of, of uh, between the air and the ground which is, needs to be there and cannot really be broken if this is gonna work properly. So we build in a need to have the stakeholders and all these kind of things working together. This is <coughs> for, for one point in time, but it's also a closed loop if you look at it from a planning. This is this flight, as someone referred to it, that it took place in, in February, went from Toulouse and, and all through the French and then the Maastricht airspace and then Danish and then up to Sweden airspace with the first initial 4D flight. So it's not only the one single interaction which is a closed loop, but basically it starts before that the flight plan and the track director exchanges here is available through all these flights. We have the same picture of what is happening. Now, no, maybe in Stockholm you don't care so much what is happening here at any point in time. But still, that, that goes all the way until we land the aircraft here. And that, that works towards this initial, or this 4D interaction uh, between these. So th th there's a definitely a change in the way we do this in terms of air traffic control uh, than, than today. 
I, I stole this picture from Airbus. I hope you don't get offended here. But it, it, I, I wanted to take a totally different perspective on, 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 um, on, on these kind of things uh, based on the experience. It's one thing to talk about how we develop new things and automate things take place. But another thing in terms of, of, of making sure that the system interacts is the industrial process or the decision-making process. If, if my process is here with industry on the ground, how, how do you want to design your system and, and evolving your family of systems over here? Uh, knowing that I'm not 100% in control of, of the development because I, I have another element here which I cannot any longer separate from each other. My possibility to do what I'm supposed to do here is also dependent on the airframer or the airline and so on. And how these things glue together. And I think this is an aspect of, of trying to understand how we, when we automate, to, to build in this understanding that we need to push also for a very close sort of, like in CSR, I think it's a, one of the best things. It's not the most innovative program, but it's the absolutely best way of working together to get something sustainable or susten sustainable done in this, how this, this interaction between these industry parts. And then you have also the airport system, which is not shown here, of course, but they will eventually interact. And someone talked about swim here earlier. This will, of course, be a swim issue. And, and how on earth are we going to make that sure that, that the development is synchronized from a liability or from a, a, your perspective you're taking on that, moving through that? Okay. Now to, to a totally different topic uh, or system orientation <coughs> that, that is more coming from, from uh, the Swedish perspective uh, of, of remote travel services. Mm -hmm. We'll take the next slide here. I saw there was something referring to this before. <coughs> this started, now I go a little bit back on history. The, the idea behind this was this is the, the north, there's not so warm, it's much colder, there's much less people and, and the distances are much greater. But they are around, I think it's called 100 airports up there, of which 10 has some financial sort of ground to be existing. But the rest are there for critical infrastructure, long distances and so on. The costs are very high to keep those going, but they are needed, they are desperately needed to keep the infrastructure going. And how do we cope with that when the ATC cost at some point was 40% 40, 40 of the airport's total cost? And they come to me and say, Niklas, you cannot do this. I, I cannot afford it. Well, then I say, well, then you have to close your airport and then reduce, well, I, I need to have openness when the, my customers want to come, and so forth. So that was a problem. And a little bit, I think the, the airlines and the airports, they have been through a lot of business transformation lately, and I think this is the start where we realized you need to transform our business as well on the smaller airports towards those new needs and new situations. And that, that triggered six years ago, uh, and, and what I show you now will be in operation in one year. So it's a very rapid process because the case was clear, but it was also not so dependent maybe as the one I showed you before. Okay, thank you, the next slide. So what could we do in, in that situation? Uh, well, the option of pay cuts with controllers, not a very good idea. Uh, competition, that already taking place. That, that would give us some, some kind of, of, of uh, uh, reduction in cost. Do nothing, it's always an option for a, state-owned company, reduce service level. Yeah, that's something you can negotiate, of course. That's something you can see what, what, what are the sort of boundaries or thresholds you want to be. And or the other, of course, is to, to, to increase the automation. And that was sort of the, the idea given by this remote tower idea. I think the automation was the way to go in terms of smaller airports and air traffic services. Okay, next one. So let, let's assume then that this was the idea, that, that today there's one tower, one airport, one controller, and doing a fantastic job, uh, and, but if, considering the amount of traffic, if you can use sensors to say, well, we have a multiple airports that is controlled from one center. Not saying that one controller take care of five airports, but we just bring the data in and we can have 10 controllers sharing 10 airports over the time, and then sometimes there's a lot of traffic in Florence or Fiance or some of the somewhere else in Pisa and so on. And we can bring them into one. That, that was sort of the basic idea. And of course, we, we needed to connect um, these airports to, to, to the center. I will go into this, but just in order to point on the sensitivity. So one of the sensitive areas when doing this is to make sure that you have connection via swim or via anything you like to call it. Uh, so this is an area where, where there's been a lot of, of 
of development, but it follows the normal society change, right? That, that com the, the way of exchanging information is not the issue. Uh, but here you have the criticality of, of this that we need to take into account and uh, build into the remote power uh, safety case. Okay? We are, if you do this, you no longer have your eyes there, so according to regulations, you will be able to look out from the airport and, and, and make sure you have a, uh, your, your runway uh, in sight. And now it's being replaced by, by other means of, of looking at you, by cameras. Uh, you can have other sensors as well. But the basic idea, from smaller airports, uh, you cannot have that many kind of radar system. Then you sort of fall to another trap. It gets expensive to automate. So this was the most less expensive way to automate uh, this and create a remote power. These are the things that can look like this. And these are the cameras which gives you the views and, and, and all these kind of things. Of course, they need to take care of minus 30 degrees or plus 40 degrees and so on. But apart from that, it's a fairly straightforward issue, okay? So what happens uh, when you have all these kind of sensors and it, when everything is digitized, right? So the, the, the thing that you can do with your, with your system or your, your remote tower service is that it's no longer limited to, to looking out, but you can add things like on the screen, you will say the radars, uh, everyone who worked in a tower knows that it's not that easy to detect everything. Uh, but you can have assistance here by, by the computers. The runway incursions will, uh, if you use these kind of things, the, the system will help you to track. There's something happening here which you didn't know of. Please take a look at that. And, and here, in terms of fog, this is the latest thing we've done. This is extremely good. You could just, there's no new technology, just infrared. It, it expands. The day becomes one hour longer in that end and one hour longer in that end because of the ability to see the track, the, 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 the movements earlier. And, and, and this is also something that we need to trust. If you're gonna get the benefits out of that, make sure that we can trust this and, and be liable in terms of using that. And, and that builds down the digital sort of picture of, 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 of the air traffic services, okay? And then, of course, the, there will be the same, similar type of, of uh, way of working for the controllers, like the Boeing Air, plane cockpit or the Airbus cockpit or Bombardier cockpit, now maybe the controllers will be faced that they will have a similar way of working if they have this airport or that airport, it doesn't matter. They, their environment looks the same, although the pictures might be different. So it's a way of changing the look at that. And, and it's probably just a technical improvement, but it's interesting from a, a human point of view if that can help. So the next one is a little bit more interesting when we work with these kind of things and, and, and also the environment of increased automation you need to look at, at the, um, the humans. Uh, unfortunately, we are, we are them. We are there and we need to. The next generation, I don't, I don't know what to call this generation, but the, you had Twitter and Flickr and, and blah, blah, blah. These are the generations that we are now training for being controllers. And they have expectations on the automation, which is far beyond, if I talk without due respect, the maybe the old school of controllers. They have another way of looking at safety. There's no difference on that. but. The way they want to use these things are, are, are totally different from technology. <coughs> then, of course, how they do that when they look at the, this is the surface movement, sort of the, the runway incursion stuff. How they do a look at and use these kind of things. So, we, but it's, it's like, it sounds like very good that everyone, all of a sudden it works. But, of course, you need to take into account that new generation also when you build in your case of looking at that. I think this is extremely interesting work and material for, for any kind of area of aviation, how we do this next generation <coughs> of the units, yeah, you can take the next, yeah. And then next picture and, and yeah. Last slide, uh, the, the, a lot of things that, that, that we discussed uh, in terms of, of, of uh, this remote issue. If you lock yourself a paper into the, the cabin, well, in 2028, is there maybe an issue? How could you trust something sitting in a tower looking out with no support from this digitized environment. Is this possible? <coughs> I don't know, but maybe that, uh, if you go back again, uh, because the, well, you talked about, could we believe that? Or could we believe, you, you discussed here about the unmanned, could we imagine that there will be a, 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 a
combat unmanned vehicle uh, that we need to integrate in our ATM system, if we just revert 20 years, could we imagine that we are not facing a challenge to integrate these type of things? Interestingly that, nobody said it. These are the perfect I4D airplane because there's no pilot who can intervene. The only way they can fly is through an, a 4D trajectory from start to land. Well, maybe you can do a little bit like that remotely. But basically, they, 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 they are the ultimate I4D. So maybe this is the marriage that we need to take, that kind of development and marry with the civil tra commercial air traffic. Okay. And this is then the question for, for this, of course, in terms of, of, of automation and so on. How do we glue, now make larger circles uh, in terms of responsibility here and how they come together? That, that's from my, from my perspective the, the important thing, but without changing the fact that we need to have a, a stable system. So thank you very much for, for, for taking the time. Thank you.